<sighs> Welcome back. We are the Grace Swan Guild. This is the Grace Swan Guild Book Festival for 2023. We just had broad chats from Hawaii come really from Alberta, Canada, go over digital distribution, digital innovation for the future, and the impact of artificial intelligence on models that are being inspected as they change in the world. Very exciting stuff. Our next guest on the book fair is a prof, uh, Meltem Ballin, and she's got a new book that is coming out in 2024. We're early days, but timed it just right, which is a couple months when Bellum would have been, Meltem would have been much more comfortable doing this. So, but she's agreed to brief us on this new book called, uh, it's actually Creation of Art, um, of images and the impact of generative AI. But uh, Mel Meltem, if you could introduce yourself to the group and uh, go to the backstory, and uh, I will give you control over the screen. And on this one, we actually took the opportunity to generate a sample of your future novel, just in case you wanted for for your impressions. And Dali was good enough to put a typo in there to prove that it was an AI. So there's no uh, surprises there of human involvement. So welcome <laughs> to the festival. And I hand it over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation and welcome to my classroom. It's actually empty now, so you can hear the echo. It's me, my dog, and a couple of my students. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Um, I didn't get a lot of chance, chance to prepare a slideshow or any book chapter, but we are going to write together because I've been I've been looking at my date deadline from the rear mirror, so I need to catch it. So today, I brought my chapter three. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I've been in computer vision and AI little over twenty five years. I started doing it twenty five years ago. Uh, when AI was hopping in the military and you were talking about the egg tech. So egg tech was big, but it's it was all about the NATO military application. Then the grant money died. So overnight we became the computer vision teams. So then I became a computer vision person. Now here I am, I'm talking about the artificial intelligence, but I am today in this book, even though I am cheering artificial intelligence, I'm going to really, really challenge artificial intelligence. That's why I'm very excited about uh, chapter three of my book, uh, which is going to be published with many publications. Is it about, it's about the illusions, optical illusions. We we human being have a lot of uh, um, a, a lot of uh, old information. Our vision can be fooled, um, but this is our perception. So, how are we going to teach generative AI? Then we can call the generative AI perceptional AI. So that's what I want to talk to you today. Um, and now let me share my screen and tell you a little bit about how I decided to write this, this chapter. So I started as an engineer and then decided that I, I knew very little about AI without learning the biology behind what AI is and how AI works. I couldn't be I couldn't be an engineer. I couldn't be working with the uh, with the AI. So I went back. I studied neuroscience. I studied particularly human retina and how human retina connects to the human brain. So while I was doing that, um, I learned a lot about uh, illusions, um, and I will read about what illusion is 
and what we are gonna, gonna cover here. So generative AI and image processing. So when, when we talk to people right now, they say that image processing died or everything that we knew uh, as old uh, data scientists, old AI people, those are all the, they, they tell us that what we know is old. But in, in reality, uh, there, there are a lot of intersections and a big harm, harmony between old techniques and generative AI. For example, generative AI we've been hearing requires large data set, sets to be trained and image processing techniques can, can, can be used to understand and interpret the images in order to make better predictions by reducing noise and enhancing the important features in the images training the generative AI. Then generative AI can be used uh, to create new images so that we can feed our image processing uh, tools and techniques so that we start building uh, a data set which is cheaper and not biased. So it's a very harmonious back and forth relationship. And then we can use these two techniques to do image to image translation. And uh, this will involve converting one image to another image, such as converting a black and white image to color image or converting a day image to a night image. All these things can be done back and forth uh, between generative AI and the image processing. Um, so, but all in all, these are all missionary uh, numbers, zeros and ones moving between two channels. Um, how are we going to make it more fuzzy? It is, uh, it is basically the human perception. So human perception is the process by which we take, in, we take in an information from around us and then make sense of it. Um, so it, it is a complex process that involves our brains interpreting the signals from the senses, is illusions are, uh, illusions are part of it. So illusions are per, uh, perceptual experiences that do not much match reality or subjective perception of the reality. So sometimes we see something in the corner of the room, but in reality, it is just a light reflection. So that's that's our Im imagination, that's our illusion. So computationally, we cannot really put that object at that corner so it's not there it's not there we can try to do it but it's very very complex so generative ai in the current capacity is not able to do that but how we are gonna do it we are we are gonna integrate the human this is where the human and human no knowledge becomes very important because human subjectivity is going to label, manually label this data back in the generative AI models. Um, so let me start with the shepherd's table but, um, and it will, it will come back to you um, from a perspective that you have heard. Um, the shepherd tables, so you have two tables one is from the perspective view, another might be an angle view or the head view of the table. So these tables are totally different, different sizes from my perspective. And let me ask you, how do you see these? Which one is larger? Which one is thinner and longer? It looks like the bottom one is longer and thinner and the top one is shorter and thicker to me. But I know you're tricking me, Meltem. Anybody else? 
Same size. Anybody? Any guesses? I second uh, Rob. Milton, is this one of those ones where a monkey is running through the background and I can't see it? Is it? <laughs> yes, yes. So the shepherd <laughs> tables are an optical illusion. Those, those two tables, I think it was Gordon. Gordon said that they are the same size. Yes, they are the same size. But whatever you put from the perspective or head view, they we always, depending on where we are at, uh, we see them um, in a different size. And teaching that the computers is kind of like pain in the neck. So the, the code is here. When we look at the code, this is where, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a simple table. So the size of the tables are three pixel by one pixel. So they are the same, but um, when we turn them around, they start becoming different sizes. So that is called the shepherd, shepherd table illusion. Uh, shepherd is the professor's name. So he found this in 1990 and called this uh, illusion as the turn, uh, turning table illusion. And later, it became shepherd table. It has been moved, uh, used in a lot of gaming. It has been used in uh, board games, movies. So it became quite famous because uh, it, it is easy to create this illusion. As easy as it gets, it is very hard for the computers to create this illusion. Um, so one of the techniques that I'm challenging is here uh, is the shepherd tables. And, you know, this this text te text is very short and looks uh, simple. It took me to 15 days to really figure it out how we can actually uh, represent this to engineers because my in this my audience are the engineers and what i am trying to convey to them is that uh you know you're saying you're gonna take over computers that the programs that you're creating is gonna take over the world but there is a world underneath that which involves yourself so this is this is how i am trying to represent this chapter. Um, so also there is another complexity in this. When we zoom in and out, uh, our perception of the tables are gonna change. When we tilt the head, we are gonna start seeing the tables differently. So the, the one in the back is gonna be longer and thinner and you cannot do it with the computers. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, now OpenAI, when they talk about Q, they actually literally have thousands of people looking at the same images and labeling them. Um, so then eventually when they have a high rank, of the particular perspective, they will use that to train their algorithm. Any questions un until now about my lovely shepherd table? <laughs> hey, this, is, uh, this is fantastic. Uh, when you were doing this, like how much Euclidean geometry are you basing the algorithm that you developed? Um, is, so is it Euclidean and you're unwinding because you've got to create perspective what humans see not what a computer wants to create so what was the what was the math behind this that supported the algorithm you wrote in math behind this so mm -hmm. it's basically i i am creating two tables mm -hmm. um, and the tables the distance only thing that i'm looking at the distance and the focal point. So I am presuming that I am sitting in front of these two tables mm -hmm. and I'm in the center. Uh, so it's basically math itself 
uh, when we look at it, it's very simple. So we have this formula, which is, oh. uh, yes, <laughs> distance from the table. And then uh, we also have the slope. Slope is the where we are looking, how we are looking at these tables and how they are positioned. Um, and then the, uh, the N factor, which is the zooming in and out. So this is this is the formula that I'm taking uh, and then implementing in this this algorithm. I'm putting the checker pattern. It's neither here nor there, but we are coming to the che uh, checkerboard illusion to uh, give you some uh, perception that you're actually measuring to the back background. So if I didn't have that, your illusion would have been bigger. And if you're interested, the biggest library is actually coming from liberal, uh, a liberal arts school. So Bennington Middlebury College uh, here in Vermont has a large library of the images that they've been taking. They are all artists and they are taking pictures to give this uh, perception to the, uh, to the, uh, to the images. Uh, with computation, what we use called something stere stereo vision. Stereo, uh, stereo vision is the fact that we take pictures of this table from two different picture, two different angles, and then we look look at the difference between the depth. So like this, uh, so I have left and right eye. You know, I'm mimicking this with the camera. So my right eye, when I look from the right eye, it looks at looks at it uh, from a deeper angle. So uh, my right eye distort to the back, and my left eye actually sees it as thinner but taller. So then, at the end of the day. I have this image, uh, which is for the for the left eye, and then that image for the right eye. So that is that is actually how we we create computationally we create that shepherd's table perspective. And um, this is. Uh, Another example, but this is this is not new. This has been used in the gaming and other industries. But how we are gonna add that perception um, indication without having two cameras? That's the question. We usually in, in nature we don't have two cameras. We just look at it and decide. And the second illusion that we are gonna talk about is the checker shadow illusion. Um, so when you look at this image, what do you see? So these these areas A, B, and let's say C, are they the same color or are they, do you see any difference in the colors? A looks uh, could you just zoom a little bit more, uh, Malcolm? It's not, thank you. A looks darker than B to me. A is black, yeah, gray. And then let's say we have C here, compare C to B. C is lighter than B. Um, in reality, and in for, for some people, when you look at it, where I am sitting, and from my perspective, C looks darker. Um, but this is this is another illusion that we create. So it when I regenerated this with the computer, uh, it it will look like this. So they are black and white or gray and white. Uh, it's not going to have any uh, shadow effect. So 
but with our eyes we have this shadow and this shadow turns with us and then our tilt and uh, where we are sitting becomes very important um, and that is as simple as it looks uh, that's a very difficult uh, problem to solve so this is kind of separating that that image uh, so we are looking at it and this is our little cylinder and this is the reflected image of this one on the computer or on a mirror so it will look like this um, uh, but in reality from our angle we have this scattering light um, even if we didn't have this uh, cylinder we were gonna have us we were going to have a scattering light effect um, so that that is also our kind of def defect, our defect uh, retina always adds some scattering or complexity to the scene to make it uh, to make it easier to see the actual object in the scene. Um, so this is called checker effect, and Mr. Adelson. Uh, He's, he's one of my heroes, actually, because I have used this image over 25 years. I It never occurred to me that I needed to take uh, permission from him. And I didn't even know that he was alive. Um, but the other day I emailed him and um, I teach at a college, which is called Bennington College uh, here in Vermont. He was born and raised in Vermont, and his father, Mr. Adelson, uh, started the psychology department here. So he not only gave me the permission to use the image, but he also gave me permission to recreate his algorithms and recreate his uh, uh, his work. So therefore, I was actually able to take his work from there and I recreate it. So this is actually, this is our retina view. So we actually uh, kind of uh, know consciously, uh, our brain consciously gives this distortion to the colors uh, so that we, we can easily uh, separate the images. So this, this is another phenomena that um, illusion that computers have difficulties to understand nowadays. So we need another thousand people to sit and uh, figure out how everybody's uh, seeing this, what angle they are sitting. But this is this is my favorite. Uh, Amos Room, who heard about the Amos Room or Willy Wonka? Being uh, being a giant um, in the chocolate factory in sixties. Did you guys see Willy Wonka? The old one. Old one. Yes, yes the original. Original. Yes. Yes. So, yes. so when you when you see Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory, there is a scene that Willy Wonka is giant, and everybody else are midgets. Uh, in reality, the room is like this. Uh, so Willa Wonka is here, and everybody's everybody else is back there. So then, our we and they let us to look from like this little center hole that we presume that this room is actually a rectangle, and. And then everybody behind the room becomes like little midget, and Willy Wonka becomes a uh, becomes a giant. And this uh, is now tomorrow. The... Brains are useless. They make up shit all the time. I know, I know. <laughs> and then we say, "Hey, you know, generative AI, do something for us with what we what shit that we create." <laughs> we create. <laughs> but this is this is. This is kind of fun thing to do. Um, um, I mean, I don't. I, Bashir is here. 
uh, in Turkey, they make us, they made us in when I was in elementary school, secondary school, they actually made us cut these rooms from the paper. So we used to play uh, like doll game with this. So this is kind of the room version of it. Um, we are looking from here and there is a, we are looking from here, there is a distortion but our eye is saying, hey, you know, this room is uh, is just a box. And we see all these pictures. And the the expensive movies use this effect a lot. Uh, Lord of the Ring, uh, when yep. they were uh, they were underground, they use mm -hmm. Amos Amos rooms. In Toronto, in the museum, the science museum, there's a they call it a crazy kitchen. But now I know their real name. It's an Ames room. Yes, and this gentleman, Miss Mr. Amos, uh, actually, this is the earliest illusion. He found out about this illusion nineteen forty six, and that's why um, the earliest cameras that uh, we had was using this technology. So it allowed that allowed you to use that tunnel vision. Um, so this is a this is a very fun illusion. I hope one day the robots do it for us, but they are so black and white so they don't see this. So when you add this put this room there and then put the sizes, obviously I know the size. So the size is gonna look like this. This is longer, this is shorter. It just tells me three guys at this at at this size. This guy is not midget actually. This guy is five uh five nine. And uh, this this guy is five eight. Um this guy is around there. But when you look at them, this guy is a giant. Um so this is uh Mr. Amos. And one of the areas that uh, this can be used. Uh, again, models can be tra trained to generate images like this one, uh, and this will really, really take up a lot of uh, budget, take out a lot of budget from the mar marketing because they use these kind of illusions in marketing all the time, and then they move people from uh, one place to the other. And in order to even build this physical room, you spend a lot of uh, a lot of time and money. It has to be the search and uh, search and size. You have to have this uh, some objects to dis uh, distract your vision. So he, they can actually, if Gens can do it, the budget is gonna be slimmer for this. And. I'm not gonna talk about my uh, code. Uh, and the last one that I wanna touch, because I, I think I'm just three minutes to end of my talk, ego motion. We all have egos, right? But it does, it does nothing to do with uh, our egos. Our brain is when we see kind of patterns, the fractional patterns, our brain, our brain thinks that everything is moving, but in reality, uh, the objects are not moving. Objects are actually uh, still, uh, but we make those objects moving. Uh, and when we try to do that with the computers, other than the fractals, you know, the fractals are the ones that people recreate the snowdrops and we see all kind of beautiful models. Uh, those are fractals. Uh, we, other than those images, uh, computers cannot create this motion, motion illusion. Uh, ego motion is one, Ill, uh, one technique uh, that I found uh, can help with this perspective. Um, so we have a viewer point again. We need to look at this from one perspective, and we need to know all everything about the uh, the camera, 
uh, what are the DPI's resolution is, uh, and what angles it is using, and optical flow. So if we know those, we can actually create this ego motion, which is the frame by frame, by frame uh, motion. Uh, so that's the closest thing that I came, uh, that uh, I was able to create this ego motion. And I hopefully, let me see if I, if I have the code, I'm going to show you. I think this is it. But this is another illusion. There are a couple of questions in the chat. We'll deal yes. with them afterwards. Don't we've got them there? So we'll get Ken to ask them. And I can, I feel that uh, some of the solutions you're working on are part of the reason today this implementation has caused people not to like metaverse implementations. Yes. So this is going to improve metaverse implementations because they'll seem realer to us. Yeah, so this is, this is somehow I cannot move this. Um, it needs to move. So move, room is actually, room is standing, but because of I am moving, um, it's just moving. And I run this. Let me. We want to refresh it. It's running so fast, that's why. Well, we can just... Yeah, I'm not oh. gonna debug here, but I think there is a debug in my code. <laughs> Um, I can't start answering questions, so I'm just going to... Uh... Ken, why don't you ask your question, if you can? Yeah, if, uh, so... Um, go ahead. So, so yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you missed a bunch of stuff earlier. Uh, I, I, I was unfortunately called away for a bunch of stuff, but this is fascinating to me. And and Melta, I, I, I hope I've got that name right. Um, yes. I I love optical illusions uh, and... and, and the, the way that the human mind fills in gaps and things like that. And there's a, a science fiction writer, James P. Hogan. Who yes. wrote a series of books. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yes. But, um, are, are you? Are, have you read his stuff? Yes. My my father-in-law is one of him, was one of him. I always forget, forget that he died, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I, I love his books, but he wrote a series Actually, he, he used this theme in several of his books, but one of them was Interverse. And the concept was rather than having to store and, 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 and replicate all of this information from the real world into uh, the immersive world, uh, rather set up the immersive world so that the human mind would fill in the gaps, much in the way that we can take a colon and a, and a parentheses and turn it into a, a smiley face or a frown. Uh, yeah. And 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 so, do you see? You know, part part of the interesting about AI is can AI and kind of imagery in the same way that human beings do. Um, and and so, have you done anything in in regards to that as far as uh, looking at how AI interprets these illusions? to be what we think they are uh kind of in and in, in one of the, the traditional ones is the duck and rabbit illusion uh depending on how you look at it but does does a is ai able to in, in, to to actually interpolate that um not really that's why um i mean it it depends on what angle you're looking at uh so how far you are in how your retina actually it, I mean, it also depends on the retina sensitivity. <clears throat> okay. So, the, it, so, there's a, there, so there's a physical nature to this, not just a, a, an interpretation. 
Yes, I mean, these these things that I am suggesting here are all suggestions, but again, going back to the conversations, I think I just uh I was just uh catching end of it. It is it is all about data and how we prepare the data. And if we have enough data and if we have enough computation, one day uh AI might be able to be perceptional, but currently what we are talking with the illusions, we are talking about the perception, we are talking about something that how uh, how easy to fool our vision or how easy, easy to fool our senses. So that's what we are talking about. But AI okay. is just taking the computation, computation the numbers, and then maybe mm -hmm. giving a little bit fuzziness, but all those fuzziness are again defined by the numbers. So how we can take it out of the numbers and at this perception, it's still in the hands of human. Eyes, ears, hands, whatever. Yeah. So 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 one of the things I I I I've talked about in my book and, and in other in other conversations, I had one this afternoon, a conversation with somebody about the inherent bias in an AI system is not just bias based upon, you know, how many of uh, a certain demographic are involved in things, but really bias on the nature of, uh, you know, how we perceive things. Yes. So, 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 and, and part of that is a physical bias, you know, based upon our, you know, some people like it to, to be 69 degrees and some people like it to be 75 degrees in a room and they're both comfortable. So they both have their own bias on that. Is, do, do you think, think that we'll ever hit a point where AI can construct its own bias in that kind of nature as far as the physicality of things? Or is that something that is uniquely human? I mean, the, the I, you know, I when I studied neuroscience, I studied neuroscience from physicist perspective, but also uh, philosopher perspective. And I still like really, really respect and read Cyril uh, and in that in that scenario no offense to anybody uh, the the mind is only human so that mind idea we can teach the mind to the computers because it's all like high compute because now we have that power but that mind is like everybody has different mind I forgot right. to mention initially <laughs> that I'm I'm neurodiverse, so I forget to speak speak sometimes. I am writing is so hard for me. That's why this book has been happening last 10 years. And I'm so horrified. Like, what if they try to take that, you know, neurodiversity and then try to put everybody in one box like uh the i don't want to call it neuronormal because everybody is neurodiverse from one perspective or the other so if we if we try if we are put in one box and if we actually think and do the same thing uh at least from the computer perspective that is when the creativity and innovation is gonna go away mm -hmm. I'm really horrified about horrified from that perspective, but it's not the power of the power of the computers, what they can do or what they cannot do, how much we give and then we let them to do things for us. Yeah, no, that's 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 very interesting. It's 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 you know, it's it's an area that I think we're just nipping i mean we, we haven't even put our toe in the water on this mm. really yet and 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 it's a it's a ripple because you know by nature the physicality of and and and, and the neurodiversity of ai is a reflection of what we provide to it true true fascinating uh, i'm uh a little minor comment, and I'd like you to, to reflect, Meltem, 
And what I'm seeing, uh, what I know is the brain is relatively speaking for all its abilities, it's really small. Yes. And it runs on, on a few watts. Dim light bulb, 28 watts. Uh, is, is some of this, um, the way we handle and we deal with, humans deal with optical illusions, is it, is it just makes us efficient and allows us to store less memory. Oh my goodness! I also have a note here. I'm I'm interrupting myself now to ask you about Leonardo da Vinci. I it's <laughs> really, uh, so anyway, uh, backing up a sec. So do you think that uh, this the techniques that Ken is alluding to and what you're developing does it compress reality to smaller signals so that it's possible to have smaller machines to to work? like robots that work in reality because yeah i mean we learn compression right it's a form of compression yeah i mean uh we are i mean i i know the vision the best but we we kind of extract the features in the vision case we take the edge so that's the motion illusion that i tried to show but my code is is not running uh so that that edge detection we take just the corners of the image and mm -hmm. we don't know what is filling but we recall from our memory so that's the kind of long-term short-term memory idea mm -hmm. yes uh, we actually we are very lazy and also the world is full of information so we compress the information in our brain mm -hmm. Amazing. Please go ahead. Why are we looking at this? Oh, this is kind this is kind of the uh Ken's question and everybody in the room where people has be has been trying to mimic this this mind and memory this this long. Then obviously they were not like they were not so kind. They were actually pulling the data physically <laughs> but now we have uh we have a we have a kinder way to do that uh i think we are further along than that but still um it it, it is kind of a uh human is kind of a interesting uh creature uh to study i mean there is there is a book that i read years ago it's called uh mind and mind and flesh it talks about the brain and the uh it talks about the mind and brain as a flesh um it really uh the i i forgot the name of the author but he really gives those layers it's it's very systematic and easy to understand uh, so he he separates like the higher level of perception, lower level of perception, and then puts the mind and the flesh side by side. Um, so every layer has a flesh, every layer has a mind, and it just that makes the brain complex. Other than that, brain is small and uh, brain is lazy. Because it, the brain has to do other things. Brain has to make make us breathe. Brain has to tell us that we are hungry. What's the name of that book again, Malcolm? Uh, Mind and Flesh. Okay. After this, I'm going to send it to you so you can share with people. Oh, yes. That was very fascinating. How old is it? Um, I think it's been like 15, 20 years. Yeah. New. New, new, new. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just I'm just trying to look for it. I'm not finding it. That's all. Maybe it's not. I mean, it's the author is from Israel, uh, but somewhere at home. I will send it to you. Sure, that's great. Any more questions? I was seeing like a lot of messages, but I lost. <laughs> hey, Melton, where do you want to? I mean, this is uh, obviously. Um... Uh, going to turn into a book and a piece of work, but where would you like to take all of this work? Um, like, what's the the next three to five years of your involvement in doing all this stuff? Where do you want to take it all? Um, I mean, 
what I wanna, I mean, I wanna see this. Uh, this time, I want AI to be successful, and I want, uh, I want to be in the computation part. Like, I don't wanna be in this sexy part of the things that I'm talking. I wanna help specifically women, uh, women, to grow in the field. Fifteen percent of the AI uh, workers are women, and uh, also neurodiversity because there is no even statistics there. But um, I want to provide them opportunity to get into AI without even knowing what to do, but bring their creativity and innovation so that's where i want to take this that's why i took this challenge to write this book this is kind of the funnest funnest chapter of this i'm not even going through the my mean editors and my mean technical editors uh but i'm just taking um so i took this challenge to take a very technical topic which is computer vision and trying to explain to the people who has no computer who have no computer science background or computer vision background um, that's my goal to take it to the level that everybody can take a step and can make their decision open ai is not the big decision maker microsoft, microsoft is not the big the, the best decision maker I mean, they are saturated, right? They, there is no technology there anymore to be developed. They are not going to hire computer scientists. They are not going to hire software engineers. Now, the you were talking about EgTech. EgTech is big. Uh, healthcare, everybody talks about it. But I'm just looking at those edge areas where creativity can play a big role. So I want to go, I want to take this book and take it there to everybody to put the innovation in their business. Awesome. Thank you. That's some quick question on, uh, on the chat. I've put in the uh, screenshots from the 80s music video of Dire Straits where they have <laughs> the uh, 3D images and stuff uh, of two guys carrying items and so forth. It would be fun to see how uh, the computer vision processes that video, whether you know it accurately uh, identifies the objects that are with and so forth. I mean, this is a light note, uh, but my specific question is in the eighties, you know, we had these uh, 3D uh, glasses with like, I think a red and a blue uh, filter. And uh, even though it's not, it wasn't really uh, 3D. I practically remember, you know, really pushing myself to process it as 3D. So in a way, uh, was it really our brain that's tricking it or was it the glasses that were uh, helping us to see it 3D? Thank you. I don't know. Maybe it was glasses or just we were so groovy. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. Hey, Melta, this is great. I love how, what, how deep we've gone into the, the technology and then uh, your goal of elevating it to people that aren't just straight technologists is great. But outside of computer science and uh, neuroscience, what are you reading? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. So nowadays I'm uh, really following the Max Sweeney's so I read Maximinis. Maximinis? Uh, yeah. The Greek. No, no. I will... Mac. Sweeney's. Uh, it's, it's actually quarterly. Um, and they have... They, they come with a lot of books. Oh. Uh, so I suggest everybody to read it because they... Um, Oh, McSweeney's. I, yes. Ah, I read McSweeney's and I bought some of their books. They're yes. brilliant did editors. You, did you read the book by by him, McSweeney, uh, called Circle? 
No. Oh, yeah, I did read Circle. Yes. yes. It's, a, it's a great book. David Eggers, by the way, folks. Uh, Dave Eggers, yeah. A very famous American author, and he, he set up a publishing company to bring humor back to America. Yeah. Like he's got a sharp edge, doesn't he now? Well, the, the reason that I, uh, I am reading... Uh, his quarterly right now, it's very timely and he's bringing some of the uh, short shorts that he uh, published in the past. One of them was about like one uh, Pakistani family and an Indian family. They are both Muslims and the uh, kind of the uh, fight between them. Uh, so that was that is one of the very famous short shorts. Um, but at the end of the day, the the kind of the uh, the the joke about it is the fact that you know um, you're you're not even seeing that your aim and goal in the life is the same. And we see that with you know I write about AI, but we see that in general in the world because we twenty twenty three was worse than 2021 in a lot of senses. It's very, nobody knows what's going on. Uh, so that uncertainty really gives people a sense that nobody has that baseline anymore. So that's why I like books like Max Simini's. And I'm spending a lot of time going back and forth reading his books. I, I like him because he, uh, he writes with a technique called hyper-reality. Yes. Uh, and so all his fiction is hyper-realistic. Uh, but it's an illusion, of course, and it fits in with your work. That's fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I'm a, please, uh, other questions uh, out there, please. Otherwise, I'm just going to talk to Meltem directly and ignore all you people. <laughs> okay, I found that book. This is it. Good. Meltem. Yes. Um, so the, the model that you had with the uh, grid squares and the uh, cylinder, has anybody tried to take that into 3D to where the, the you know, you, where you can look at it from any angle, even with the same light source? Yes. Um, let um, I can set my code and I can show you um, that that was the output that I put it. Yes. It's fascinating. One, one interesting, Scott, one interesting thing is when I was in design school, this was, God, a long freaking time ago. Um, I used to create these things at Christmas. Um, it it was an open box and I painted on the inside of it. If I had Photoshop back then, it would have been freaking awesome. But I would paint in inside of it a false perspective mm -hmm. and adjust the, 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 uh, uh, the color value in as I would go back into the box. And if you looked at it straight on, it looked like the box was flat and closed and it wasn't an open box. And, and so I would do these with Christmas wrapping and ribbons that would peel apart from a false perspective standpoint. And, and, and you would actually, it would, it would flatten itself out. But if you looked at it from the side, you would break the illusion. And, and, and so, you know, I, I tried doing that in 3D when I was doing real-time 3D software and was able to achieve somewhat of the same effect. But it's very interesting what you can do with that in a 3D space uh, because you, you have much more fidelity over the and control over the environment. Uh, but it, it, it is neat to take it into the real world, the physical world, and see it transform. And this is an old technique. It goes back to the the, the Renaissance in the eighteen you know in, in the eighteen uh, hundreds when you were doing a lot of the uh, the the visual effects like that that uh, that nowadays we would look back and say, well, that's that's antiquated, but yet it still achieves some of the same things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And if, it, if it's done, oh, sorry, not. If it's done Here's properly, it's, even sure. today, it's still pretty cool, though. Oh, I work in the 3D world as well. That's why I was curious, because sometimes even my own models, I can lose perspective and I can see them actually inside out. So, yes, 
when you're yes. when you're rotating something and you think you're looking at the front of it and you're actually looking at the back of it but it you know you know it's the the optical illusion try 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 getting hooked on tesseracts for a while and, and do that <laughs> it'll blow your freaking mind <laughs> I think I I didn't have Tesseract on my bingo card, and I should have, Ken. Ah. So, <laughs> oh, so. you're talking about different Tesseract. Tesseract is actually a Google algorithm. It does, <laughs> that does. No, exist. this is this is this is the topographic. Yes. Uh, tesseract. Yes. I know. Uh, James B. Hogan writes a, wrote a great book called, and he built a crooked house. If you ever get a chance to read it, it's basically. It's, couple in California builds this house that's an unfolded tesseract and an earthquake happens and it, and it folds in on itself and I'm not going to tell you the ending on it because it's great and 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 there's there's free copies out there on the web but it's a great story I just posted the Wikipedia essay on tesseract this essay <laughs> tickles my brain that's how my brain works it makes my brain ticklish it's so, <laughs> it's such a clever it's multi-dimensional device that's it's representation in 3D in 2D. So it tickles my brain, Sean. This is very Shell Silverstein of all of you, yes. <laughs> well, here's a and million the dollar other, question. Sorry, please go ahead and mouth that. Other book that I recently read. I mean, so you guys might uh, want to read this as well. So she actually... Uh, she writes about her name's Adrian Mayer. Uh, she's she's at Stanford University. She writes about the ancient AI, and she actually talks about the Pandora box uh, and those scary, mystical uh, incidents in the past and how they are actually related to today's AI. So it's it's a wonderful book. Uh, this is this is kind of a short block about that book, but it's it's a wonderful book. Well, given I know a secret on this room that one of the members here has a daughter named Pandora. And I think this is all on purpose. It's all knitting together, Sean. It's all knitting together very closely here. That must well, be she... uh, yeah. <laughs> that must be challenging having a daughter named Pandora, given the jewelry, uh, jewelry retailer that exploded. Uh, yeah, I don't think that's why Sylvia did it. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. <laughs> All right, Another question, uh, Matt, oh, just a quick question. question. This year, last question. You make it a good one. I know. Oh you yeah. Have good oh ones. yeah. May or may so not be able to a, let uh, me let me take this off. Okay. So both as a computer scientist and a <laughs> neuroscientist, do you believe in handing autonomy to automobiles so that they will be uh, liberated from reckless drivers? So should <laughs> autos become completely autonomous, semi-autonomous? How autonomous or how much liberation? How much liberty? Well, I, you know, I can talk about it like uh, for, um, for, I mean, for a couple hours, a uh, couple months. Uh, that's a great question. But, uh, um, you know, I used to work for General Motors and I involved with crews a little bit. Uh, and I, I might, st I don't have NDA, but I might still have NDA. So that self driving, I would never ever believe in, I would never let that self driving happen. Uh, because that car, those drivers are drunker than the human drivers sometimes. Okay, so we're shorting Tesla. All right. No, I am like to lie drive a Tesla. Oh my God. I That's one of the things. Nobody works for GM here, right? No. Nope. Scott is just, uh, Scott, close your ears. <laughs> that, that is a totally different experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not driving a car I'm driving a software so that's I mean I don't really like the car oh, no, so you, you do drive you do drive a Tesla yes and then and you oh, so you're oh that's a that's a stamp uh, that's that's an approval I reversed my last statement 
<laughs> yes. I mean, I drove all the, so when I was at General Motors, they used to give me cars every three to six months, different cars. I tried all of them. Uh, this is a different experience. That's excellent. Well, thank yeah. you so much. Uh, this is this is great. I know we could go on because when uh, when people who write code make comments on what cars that are made of code to buy, I would recommend everyone listen to them. <laughs> thank you, Meltem, so much for your genius and book. Your book's coming out next year. We know that. Yes. It is coming out. We support you. Anything you need us to help you with, we support. Your causes around neurodiversity, we want more of that everywhere. We want more women in computer science. We want more neurodiverse people everywhere working with us. We want those algorithms in this machine because that's part of what human brains are. Thank you. Thank you for invitation. I'm sorry about the draftness of my uh, my presentation. I've been teaching since 11 this morning, so I had oh. to kick the students out. <laughs> I, I'm not listening to that because uh, it's fantastic to be inside the mind of the writer. And we're <laughs> right with you as you're breathing us on. Thank you so much. I'm gonna Thank stop you very much. I'm going to stop the recording now.